Ayun, ayun. Assalamu alaikum and regards. Welcome to Nali 2020. This is an event where educators and researchers display their excellent work in learning and teaching. Now, within Nali 2020, over the course of the next few days, we'll be having a series of keynotes, plenaries, and forum sessions all for you. So do stay tuned in. Now, to kick off this great event, we're going to start off with Professor in Senior Technologies, Dr. Zainuddin bin Abdul Manan from University Technology Malaysia. He will be, de be delivering his keynote speech titled Education Reimagined, uh, Higher Education Beyond COVID-19. Now, before we start the session, I'd like to brief you on the background of the speaker. He is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academics and International at University Technology Malaysia. He is also the Professor uh, of chemical engineering and has been a founding member of several initiatives, one of which is UTM Sustainable Energy Program, some organizations such as UTM a Process Systems Engineering Center Prospect, and even a faculty. He's a founding dean of the Faculty of Chemical and Energy Engineering, which is pretty cool. Uh, he began his career as an engineer in Petronas and Home Industries and has been an academic leader, educator, researcher, consultant, and professional coach for longer than I have been alive. I'm 20 years old. He's been working on it for 25 years. Uh, he has completed over 100 research and development and consultancy projects, has uh, more than 450 publications that include 15 books, chapters, has more than 200 refereed journals and uh, numerous patents uh, and 220 conference proceedings on sustainable engineering of resources. So given uh, the more than two decades of experience, uh, I, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Zainuddin to deliver his speech. Prof. Thank you very much, Niza. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm sure uh, audience feels that uh, you are more mature than uh, what your age is. Thanks again to UTM Lead for inviting me to be one of the persons to share our experiences. And the title of my presentation today is uh, Education Reimagined. From my perspective, from UTM perspective, uh, higher education, how we address the challenges of higher education beyond uh, COVID-19. Among the things that I'll be talking about, uh, I will uh, begin with uh, what I call as a tale of two biggies. Might have heard about tale of two cities. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, secondly, I will elaborate about how we intend to crisis proof and how we could uh, crisis proof higher education and uh, some of the real life COVID experiences that we have gone through. And uh, I will end with some key takeaways. Why do we need to reimagine education? Uh, these are a tale of two biggest. The first is uh, the why. I will answer the question of why. And uh, I will present the big picture of uh, the need to, the urgent need to reimagine education. Uh, you might have gone through these statistics, but these statistics are a bit out of date, meaning to say that uh, by now, this was um, published in April of this year. And uh, by now, I would, I would expect the number would be uh, somewhat higher. About 1.6 billion people are at risk of losing their jobs and have, in fact, lost their jobs. And uh, that actually constitute about half of the global workforce in the world. And by now, I would imagine the number, like I said, is a bit higher. So uh, this is a stock challenge or start crisis that we are going through where there is widespread unemployment a lot of people losing its livelihood and uh, when it comes to graduates dr noraini recently shared with us about seventy-five thousand graduates in malaysia alone struggle to find job due to covid 19 and this has not included about forty-six thousand grads who has yet to get a job from 2019 so this is this is actually a very critical issue that has been 
uh, addressed, is trying to be addressed by the higher education of Malaysia and the ecosystem of higher education throughout the world that we're trying to address. So in view of these challenges, we expect that there is another disruption will be caused by the widespread unemployment vis-a-vis -vis graduate unemployment included. People will, in the past, is getting uh, traditionally or conventionally gets a degree first before they get a job. But uh, increasingly, because of uh, the need to just grab a job, whatever job you have, even if it means sending food to people, yeah, uh, even if you have a degree or a PhD, you need to send food to people, then you get that job because the job is not a few and far between. So now people are trying to scramble to get a job yeah, before they get a degree even. So essentially, uh, um, people or learners will shift from getting a job, you know, just get any job for now, and to seeking gainful employment or better employment to secure better jobs. But for now, it is urgent for us to leave. So we need to grab a job. <laughs> Yeah, even it means driving a grab as well. So basically, this, this is one of the biggest disruption that will, will occur in higher education. And uh, we cannot stand on by and just watch without uh, any attempt to change, without any attempt to adjust, and without any attempt to address the disruptions. One thing is for sure, one thing is con constant, is that in higher education, will be continuously disrupted. So how do we address these challenges? How do we crisis-proof higher education? That is the major question, the big picture, to answer the big why. So we propose the biggest keywords that we are actually proposing is a building a flexible, resilient education ecosystem. And I will next share with you what are the initiatives that we are doing. So the, the big keywords that we are trying to, we are trying to address and uh, impress upon the ecosystem of higher education, in, especially in UTM and across um, flexible education or learning on demand is the big next big thing or the current big thing, learning on demand that covers not only fresh graduates, but more and more, the bigger uh, community of people who needs job, the employed people who needs to secure, secure better job, who needs to secure stable job, who needs to be gainfully employed. And at this time, we also recognize, yeah, uh, the big thing is that people will want to choose what they want to learn. Yeah? And they typically want to learn uh, in terms of a bite-sized uh, uh, courses. They want to uh, go for micro-credited courses and definitely they want to have something that uh, will secure them jobs that is work and competency-based typically and they can eventually stack them or accumulate them so that they can uh, eventually perhaps uh, get a higher degree or better degree. So this... Uh, means that the people, uh, our education or recipe has to be uh, for our driven and future ready. And increasingly so, people will also want to choose how they learn. They may not want to learn in the settings of a university or in the settings of a uh, uh, higher institution. They want to learn wherever they are and they want to learn at their own pace. They want to choose what time they will learn and they typically will have to work to, to, to support their lives. So even delivery has to be ruthlessly flexible. And uh, in this relation, we need to make our, uh, we need to uberize our recipe or our education, make it digital, make it tech driven, so that we will allow the 4A learning on demand, people can choose what they learn, learning anything, anytime, anywhere, and uh, at any pace. So essentially, you need to make our infrastructure, we need to make our ecosystem ready, and we need to 
be able to recognize that uh, each of the bite-sized learning in terms of micro credits can have recognition like digital badges. And presumably, if we uh, tie it with certification and partnership with outside organization, it will be it will be a lot more sellable and it will be a lot more attractive to learners of the future or current and the future. So we need to overrise our basically recipe of what uh, we can offer to people. And for this reason, we need to make our educators future ready. This is what we have been doing in UTM. This is what we have been preparing our uh, educators so that they can be digitally competent. So who transform the digital ecosystem throughout the world and through UTM? It is COVID-19, it's not our CTO, Chief Technological Officer, it is COVID-19. So we, we should thank them, we should be uh, relieved, we should thank that basically this is something that is good. COVID-19 has its better side, so um, we need to embrace this change. We need to embrace this, this disruption so that we can um, make uh, the uh, address the disruption altogether. Learners also have advantage when we go uh, fully online and fully digital or blended that we have big data. We are driven by big data. We have analytics that will be able to uh, provide us feedbacks, instantaneous feedbacks on how we can improve learning, how learners best learn and how we could uh, uh, add value to our uh, offerings from our micro-credited courses, bite-sized courses, and our digital offerings. So essentially, we also need to make sure that we continuously improve to research innovation and commercialize our offerings of uh, courses and uh, technical programs. So this is the next thing. And uh, we need to also be able to measure what are the metrics that uh, allow us to say that we have been successful in delivering flexible uh, online digital learning. So the answer is basically the impact would be, the bottom line impact would be, from our perspective, is employability of the graduates. Can the graduates secure jobs? And how many percent of the, the graduates can who uh, secure jobs from uh, our uh, the results of our education? And eventually, we also need to uh, determine whether or not the graduates are happy with their jobs, uh, feel that they, are sec they have secured a good jobs, and uh, finally, these graduates, are they able to get better position, important positions in their organization, are they able to prosper lives? So these are the five we call as uh, the high five fundamentals of prospering life through inclusive access to our lifelong education through flexible education through learning on demand. So this is the true north of uh, addressing the challenges of COVID-19 during COVID-19 and beyond of reimagining education. This is uh, the true, true north. Our mission is to pro prosper life, to make sure that we provide inclusive access to our flexible and lifelong education. So by saying inclusive access, we need to uberize our education so that we won't be limited by the location, but we will enable anyone to learn anything from anywhere at any time. So this is the, basically the true north for UTM mission, um, the hi-fi mission of prospering lives. The other advantage of uh, having flexible education that is uberized is actually uh, we would able to be able to achieve the 3P bottom line of education where we, while we prosper life with education, we also protect people. The true north is to protect people, protect the planet, then we are sure that basically the profit will come naturally. So the 3P bottom line is protecting people, planet above the profit. Let's see some real life COVID experiences that we have been through, we have gone through uh, during, uh, in our effort to um, make, to overrise flexible education, quality education. I give you a real life example that we have gone through in 25th July webinar of this year. 
this is another capacity uh, in uh, wearing another hat of mine as an expert in sustainable energy management i share experience to people across the world with uh, three other experts and uh, practitioners uh, from uh, the government as well as industry in this 25th july webinar was asked a question from zainuddin you said that UTM, what, what actually happened was UTM saved 3 million during the three months period of COVID-19, the first three months period of COVID-19. And there is this one audience who challenged me with his uh, direct questions that you said that three, UTM saved 3 million electricity bill just during the three months of COVID-19. And he bluntly put it, isn't it obvious that when teaching is done fully online, and your facilities were unused, you should save energy bills anyway. That is given. That is a done deal, is it? So what is your response to that? I uh, told them, yes, you are right. Definitely we will save energy if we don't use our facility. But so does, for example, Air Asia or Sheraton or Shangri-La, or tourism industry. They save millions and millions of dollars in terms of fuel bill or electricity bills. But what they didn't do is actually they didn't operate anyway. They had to lay off their, uh, they had to lay off their workers. Uh, they had to shed some uh, of their costs. They don't make any profit at all, if any. Yeah. So the thing is, what matters is actually not just saving anything with what is the output that we produce in comparison to the input that we put in so that's what i said as uh, the ratio of output to the input that we put in so if you save energy without basically uh, producing any output it means that you are zero in terms of productivity but in our case uh, we have a uh, build agility and leverage on opportunity in adversity and uh, enable our business, the industry of education to continue sustainably. It requires significant amount of agility to rise above the challenges of uh, such crisis, such pandemic. So we leverage on the opportunities in av uh, adversity immediately and instantly build a resilience among our educators, even though we did have to do a lot of adjustments and a lot of uh, things has been compromised, but we learn from there and we rise above the challenges. In one April, when the Ministry of Higher Education suggested that we begin on 27th April, we thought that we could make it a lot earlier. By 1 April, UTM went fully online and started with a flexible lifelong education instantly. Yeah, just right after the first PKP was announced and the PKP was extended, UTM initiated the online teaching and learning, the first university in Malaysia, while other people, other universities, we don't blame them, uh, uh, had to, in some point, one university had to open, uh, start, start their online learning only in June. So it means that students had a vacation from April, May until June, three months vacation. And still in June, we understand, we unfortunately, the ministry has not allowed universities to open up the universities. So then is the time to panic when we start a lot later, if we had started a lot later. What we did is to build flexibility in our education by extending the semester by four weeks. The first four weeks until the 27th of uh, April that the ministry has provided us, we allow lecturers to learn online and uh, adjust their class flexibly so that they ended up uh, giving, uh, ended up teaching still 14 weeks, but uh, in actual case, they are given 18 weeks to make the adjustments to their online learning. And at the same time, we mobilize the whole community, we mobilize uh, UTM lead, mobilize the whole UTM community and educate them how to conduct online teaching and learning and students as well not are also covered. Now let me share another real life COVID experience, 1A. 
I think many of us are familiar with this situation, this news where Harvard yeah, drop, drop gates as they go online. In one extent, a Columbia professor also shared that teachers must abandon preconceived notion on how grades are earned. And she recommended that automatic A is given to all students. Harvard said automatic pass should be given to all students. And many Ivy League universities came on board. I was, uh, I was seriously concerned by this kind of news. So I wrote, yeah, to jump or not jump on the bandwagon that has reached about 11,000 people, uh, received about 24 shares, and uh, there are some uh, likes. I had nightmares, I say, about the urge to jump on the Ivy League varsity's bandwagon of giving every university student an automatic A or at least a pass or fail. Yeah, great <laughs> during the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, if you read on the bottom left, why I'm saying that, here are my biggest concerns lingering on my mind. If we choose the easy way out to give automatic pass or to give automatic A, what will happen if students are largely disengaged from critical courses because if you give automatic A, who wants to learn? Or if you give an automatic pass, who will be bothered to do their assignment? Who will bother to do their exam? So what, if, what happens if the course affected? What happens if COVID-19 extends well beyond April and which is what is happening now? It might be well beyond June or well beyond December of 2021. What will happen? I'm not saying uh, Harvard or Columbia University was wrong. In my article, I mentioned that. I'm saying that they have students from Ivy League and uh, cream of the cream of the country. If you teach them or not teach them, chances are they will score A anyway. So why not give them an A? But that is not the situation in the developing countries, in countries like Malaysia. We need a lot of, and sometimes some students need a lot of hand-holding. Other students may need yeah, a lot more than others. So basically, there is no one single uh, uh, silver bullet to address this situation. So we need to do a lot of engagement with our students and don't, give, don't take the easy way out. And I think the whole university in Malaysia, when I shared, yeah, uh, did not take, did not jump on the bandwagon, even though in uh, Singapore, yeah, many of them uh, have actually jumped on the bandwagon. Now. Because, because universities like NTU, NUS, is just like uh, universities like Harvard in terms of the quality of students they are having. So I said, this is life. Yeah? Students and staff must be made ready. So they must be made life ready. Uh, to address such a situation. There's another real-life COVID experience I would like to share. I call it real-life COVID experience. One B, yeah, where uh, one student, basically this is, this is our engagement with the uh, Majlis Perwakilan Playa Student Society of UTM on 21th April. There was one question that I would like to share with you. I'll translate in English. What initiative and what is the a view of UTM is the, pre, the, the performance of uh, students dwindles, or performance of use, majority of students drop during this semester because of online learning. You as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, what is your opinion on this? What, how are you going to address that? There was one question that received the highest number of likes at that time. Something connected to what the Harvard uh, professor as well as the Columbia professor was saying. What was my response? It was a very challenging and difficult question. I said, I think yeah, at that time, we did not have grades yet for the students because it's just into a few weeks of the PKP. The situation will be reversed. Instead of student doing bad, I think student will do a lot better. Or I said better, if not a lot better than uh, before COVID-19. Why did I say that? It's very strange, uh, and I'm putting my head on the line because uh, I think the situation will be helpful to students when we do not have, um, when, when, when we try to assign students with a lot of assignments, take-home exams, 
we uh, uh, give them we are we, many of the lecturers are a bit more a lot more compassionate about grading and they are, they, 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 they are quite concerned about the, 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 the challenges that students are going through. So in, in essence, I said the situation, I think, yeah, I thought might be better. Yeah, I thought might be better for the students. To make long story short, yeah, I tell them that basically this is life. This is the way things are. In the future, you have to learn on your own. Chances are, yeah, you might have to learn a flip style. Yeah, when you have to do assignment, when your boss in the industry asks you to do assignment, they expect you to learn first. They do not expect you to give any excuses that you don't know the simulation software or that simulation software. They expect you to learn and they expect you to essentially deliver the result that they want. Do whatever you want, learn on your own, go online and go try to consult other people, do what you have, but this is life. This is what you will be grappling with in the future. So we have to make our people readily adaptable. Results presentation in the Senate hall after COVID-19. UTMI League presented the results and uh, the, the, uh, 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 well, I was not jumping because we need to know exactly if this is the true result. But that is the situation that happens. Students, yeah, the majority of students scored the highest mark. I mean, relatively speaking, over the last 10 semesters that UTM has been through before COVID-19 and the highest is the COVID-19. If you like it, I, we, will, we will share yeah, this, uh, this situation with you later on. But this is actually what I have prophesized in a way, and uh, it happened. So we went on to conduct uh, 500 online webinars, engagement with more than 70 countries. Uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was interesting and exciting to note that the classes have more than 80% attendance. Yeah? All the time, most of the time, and we have uh, we have also conducted more than five thousand till now, maybe more than seven thousand online teaching and learning classes. Real life COVID experience too. Global partnership reimagined. This is another way for us to address the COVID challenges. UTM essentially have one thousand uh, before COVID. We have about. 1,000 university that we are communicated to, we are connected to, that we make partnership with. And we invented, UTM Engineering invented, basically went on the, uh, initiated the UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series yeah, uh, for the first time. And until now, for the last three months, they have engaged with lecturers, distinguished lecturers from 35 countries. And the cost of all this, if we were to do it, uh, in person, traditional way, we would have costed us about two million or more by now. This is just uh, into the fiftieth. Yeah? When uh, as when I prepared these um, slides, it was into the fiftieth. Now in, I think they they, they are into the ninetieth distinguished lecture series and has reached countries more than forty countries or fifty countries throughout the world. This is one of the MIT lecture, one of MIT professor. And uh, we're not just having the online lecture. But this is the kickstart of our uh, communication with them, uh, engaging them as uh, examiners, engaging them as visiting professors, virtual visiting professors, and uh, discussing uh, projects as well. Then we also have academia industry partnership during the COVID-19. Before COVID-19, one of the signature uh, industrial partnership we have is uh, done by Azman Hashim International Business School, where he engaged yeah, the likes of Tony Fernandez, Tansri Azman Hashim, Tansri Wissentan in the advisory council that uh, actually uh, co-branding of their programs. And uh, UTM Engineering went on during COVID-19 to initiate this virtual engagement with uh, captains of industry <coughs> excuse me and uh, up until now i think they have gone into the 
perhaps uh, 40th yeah? leaders of industry, leaders of enterprise and captains of industry engagement. And it spin out into many other uh, collaboration activities during the pandemic. In three months, they have reached about 30,000 yeah? leading, uh, 30,000 people has been outraged by the leading captains of industry. And this have uh, skyrocketed uh, the visibility of UTM engineering just even within the periods of three months. And one of the influential global experts has been engaged by Azman Hashim International Business School is from Harvard, Professor Richard K. Vieto, who delivered his inaugural speech online yeah, uh, under the UTM Global Leaders webinar series. Real life COVID number four, learning on demand, LOD, I call it micro credential. We just launched the, the micro credential, yeah, uh, learning on demand modules, and we targeted to have 20 UTM micro credit. Before this, we have none uh, annually. We hope to have 20 by next year, by the end of next year, and 100 UTM micro credits by 2025. We're now one of the most popular. Uh, courses that we have conducted online now converted to micro credited courses is the Muet on Demand. Muet on Demand is a very popular UTM online courses. Now it uh, will be able to uh, access people who are working uh, through micro credited uh, modules. We also uh, initiated resilience by design. Cradle Center for Research and Advancement in Digital and Flexible Education is in the pipeline, and we hope to establish the center officially by the early next year. So it actually, uh, Cradle will be the one to uh, to popularize. The, will be the one to um, to basically enable the high five fundamentals of flexible education, of advancing flexible education through the recipe, flexible recipe and flexible delivery, and future ready educators or future ready chef, research, innovation, and commercialization of our programs and products, hopefully will bring the impact that we intended. So we hope to reach the 3P, to address the 3P bottom line impacts, and we have done that and when we audited and calculated or estimated what we have done over the last three to four months, uh, we have reached people from 70 countries through safe and green means and uh, has risen our profit, net profit and uh, make value of 5 million cost savings uh, through teaching and research nexus. Key takeaways, well, there will be the biggest disruption in higher education, as is happening now, is learning on demand. So we need to integrate, we need to embrace, we need to be agile in terms of addressing this biggest challenge in higher education, and we need to reimagine our education. The high five of higher education, building resilience through, we have built resilience through flexible recipe. We train the chef well, so that they be great chef that can uberize or deliver our education without having to be uh, everywhere in the world and uh, leverage on big data analytics to improve our delivery of education and produce the impact uh, so that most of our graduate, at least 95% of them, except those who don't want to work yet, uh, will be employed and reach gainful employment and finally be able to prosper lives. The true north uh, we expect to achieve is to prosper people, planet, lives above profit. We need to do all this by uh, designing resilience in our ecosystem and the cradle is the uh, entity or the center of excellence that should be able to help us do that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any queries and share uh, my thoughts further if there are any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
thank you very much, Professor Zainuddin, uh, for that speech. Okay, now um, we'll move into the comment section. Excuse me. Uh, it's echoing. Uh, we'll be moving into the comment section now, and we see we have a few questions being asked. Prof, that, that speech that you gave really did indeed reflect the decades of experience you've had in it. I enjoyed watching it throughout. And I have a few questions, but uh, let's, let's, let's first go with uh, one from Tasnim. He asks, what are the challenges that are faced by university uh, lecturers and instructors while they handle online classes that require practical and lab sessions? And how do they overcome that? Are there many similar questions like that? So I will uh, answer them all together. Okay, so um, I guess uh, I guess many people would, would want to, um, uh, to to shed some lights on uh, on this kind of uh, challenges that students are facing. So what we have done is to work on a resilient ecosystem of teaching and learning for the students and for UTM community, not just for the students but also for the lecturers. Something that will be more predictable than dynamic. During the COVID-19, if you are dynamic, for example, you said, say, for example, uh, we, 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 we felt uh, the, the ecosystem of teaching and learning in Malaysia fell into the situation where uh, the ministry had to set a date for students to come in to, the, uh, to, to, to enter the campus. Something like uh, 11 October, 1 October. Mm. But all of a sudden, you cannot enter the campus. So what happened? <laughs> uh, that is a dynamic situation that is not good. There are many other good dynamic things, but in terms of predictability or dyna dynamism that will disrupt your life, yeah, this is mm -hmm. not something that is welcomed by the students. So we predicted that and we said that we prioritize online learning, but we will look into cases where students really have to use labs. Students really have to go to practical training. Students really have to go to studio. Students really have to do many other practice. So we said one December, for example, for the time for the uh, uh, time for students to enter the campus. But before that, all lecturers have to plan their education, plan their teaching and learning to try to shift online. Yeah, because we have the first half of the semester online and the second half of the semester. Uh, as face to face or physical, nice. so that they could adapt. They they could adapt, and they could they could have a predictable date for them. As you imagine, a student from everywhere across the world. We are not saying students in Malaysia, but postgraduate, they have Seven to. Years. You have to book a ticket. <laughs> they have to have a fixed date for them to enter Malaysia, for example, right? But uh, mm -hmm. when we prioritize online learning, we can shift back easily to online learning because the majority of the courses are online. We actually go through 2,000 courses and really try to meticulously plan if this course really needs to be online and we, if we can, face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, and we can convert it completely online, including the assessment, then we do it online. Because the default, yeah, our guiding principle or our default will be online. So basically, if we really cannot uh, uh, do it uh, online, then we say, okay, this will have to do face-to-face. By this date, we'll have to do it face to face because they are required by the professional body. For example, if not required by the professional body, then, uh, then you, 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 there, there, there is not a, uh, an urgent need for you to do that. So Understood. we take all this into consideration and we plan it and we fix dates that is manageable for the uh, UTM community, students and staff, and not unpredictable. Uh, not to put them in a situation where it's so dynamic that the 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 you, you see some students having to go back and pulling their bags across the highway, for example, because they have to go back and chase out of the campus. You, see, so you don't want yes. to be in that situation. Okay, so yeah, we, we, we feel, uh, we appreciate the situation that students are going through, so we make it a, little, a lot more predictable. Not because we like every, every, everything online. It's very difficult to prepare lectures, you know, all your lectures to move it online. All of a sudden, within a few Talks. months, yeah? Uh, so the, it, it, it's a lot easier for you to make it face to face. But we think that uh, taking all these uh, challenges into consideration, Precautions. we don't we don't have any other choice. But we have to actually build in the resilience and make online as default and cater for cases. Yeah, 
where you need face to face, yeah, case by case. Understood. Thank you, Prof. Uh, next up, we have a question by Vikas Balasudram. Okay, so he says, um, "Hi, Prof. Due to COVID nineteen, the classes have been changed from the traditional way to face to face, which causes chaos among lecturers and students. In your opinion, how would the future of higher education system fare?" And uh, do students learn by themselves and attend the final exam university, especially for research universities? What's your view on this, Prof? Well, uh, I, I think uh, partly I have answered, I have responded to the question earlier. Uh, uh, we, 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 we have little choice but to embrace the challenges of COVID-19 disruption. We have little choice but to actually um, convert our courses to be micro-credited, bite-sized. Bite-sized so that students can, um, for example, many of the students later on, they are uh, mature students, they are working students already, they can take their own time to learn at their own pace, yeah, uh, module by module. Each of these module will be divided into course learning outcomes, for example, so students can actually uh, digest these courses while they're working. And... Uh, I also don't discount the fact that many of the courses may have to be still face-to-face. -face. If there are a lot more face-to-face -face requirement being reduced, then we'll be able to control the situation. We make the SOPs, standard operating procedure, so that we can schedule the students to be able to even learn from other universities. We have done this, yeah? It means that some of the students in Sarawak will go to Unimas, for example, and we cooperated with Unimas to do the face-to-face, -face, for example, exchange of students, communality, collegiality, and all these things, exchange students across Malaysia, wherever the students live, would be better than, you know, if they are, these are the situation that is needed, we, we, we'll be able to do that. But for lecturers, yeah, it will be easier for you to uh, just eat the frog. Eat the frog means you really have to, you know, it's not easy to eat the frog, but if you are hungry, then you have just to close your eyes and just do it because this is a requirement. Otherwise, you will die. This is, this is how critical the situation is. And after you have eaten the frog, you say, it's not too bad anyway. I, I should have done it earlier. Why? Because otherwise, I, I, I would have been able to travel further if I had eaten the frog earlier. You see, the thing is, uh, when uh, many of the lecturers who have converted the lecture online say that uh, it's not too bad, Prof, because uh, now we'll be able to share the recorded lecture and students will be able to repeat our lecture many times, as many times as they want and uh, understand it better. And I have even uh, used quizzes and poll EV and things like that to make the lecture interactive. I've even taught industry before this, no, online, yeah, digi digitally, and industry say they love the course because it's so interactive. We, we, we do our all to make it interactive. And you see, I, this is my personal experience. And teaching people from industry, not just a student, industry people are not as tech savvy as students uh, of UTM, for example. So if they can uh, enjoy the courses, I think UTM students should also be able to enjoy it. I have also looked at you know, some of the children, yeah, uh, I've uh, had the opportunity to look at some of the kids and uh, learning at home. The teachers are quite creative when they use quizzes and ask students to gamify the lecture. You see, they gamify oh, the lecture. With points and uh, so with on. points and things like that. You know, it's your yes. creativity. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can uh, I think, uh, given a choice, when you already have developed such tools mm -hmm. for students, you know, many students could use and use padlets and all these things. Many students yes, would padlets. enjoy more, you know, doing mm. these projects like that. It's more interactive. It's more interactive. It's more exciting. It's more uh, competitive among the students because these people can do it. How, how can I, I? I'm not able to do it, you see. So th these are the things. That, yeah. It, yeah, it does uh, instill competition, friendly competition. Yes. I do agree. Yes. Definitely, mm. and every uh, and uh, I'm I'm not saying everyone. I'm not idealist. Everyone participate, but many more students tend to participate in this kind of situation than if you compare with face to face, where they are right. at the back and mm. uh, this is like the screen is in front of them. Everybody have a personalized lecture by the <laughs> lecturers, mm. and if yeah. they don't have time, they will have to repeat the lecture. They can pause and they can stop. They can go to the toilet, for example, and then. You know they can they can it's so much flexible 
And so I, I think you have to look at the opportunities in this adversity. And in the end, you will be able to uberize in the sense that you can put your courses in Udemy. If you put your courses in Udemy and people across the world think that your course is good and if they, they think it's not good, then you know it basically. You can you have the feedback. If you have the feedback, then you have to improve. Uh, if you put in Udemy, you don't have to lecture. You just have to wash. Money comes into your pocket. Basically, people, uh, you come to yes. a point that you you will get passive income from lecturing. You see? Because <laughs> passive it's income from, Because it's uh, there already. <laughs> it's uh, immortalized. Big. Even if you, you are a pensioner, you see, because if you make your course so popular, after you learn, of course, you don't just put there and then you forget about it. No. You have to try to look at the analytics, the data analytics from the courses that you share with people, what people yeah. commented about it. Optimize it and uh, so then on. you optimize, you improve, and then basically you can make a lot of money. Even if you are not working, not lecturing, you get money from it, you see. Just like, uh, for example, Apple is selling the uh, apps for only 10 ringgit. 10 ringgit multiplied by 100,000, you can imagine that. And it's continuously you know, being subscribed by people. <laughs> That's true, passive income, indeed. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Um, next up, we have Ramesh Zaidi Rozan. Uh, okay. Professor, are you aware of uh, Mind Valley CEO vision? On the future of colleges, which is trying to make huge flip. Um, uh, you might want to remind me, Ramesh, Dr. Zaidi, the previous director of uh, Excite, UTM Excite. Yeah, maybe the vision relates to flexible education, the future of colleges. Maybe you want to um, further elaborate on this in your next comment, maybe, Dr. Zaidi. Yes. Okay, let's okay. see. Until then. You can move on to the next question, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Um, there is... Okay, one by Dr. Nina. She asks, uh, hi, Prof, may I know how you would imagine the UTM academia in 10 years, especially if we're moving towards fifth, the fifth industrial revolution? I think it's a, a fourth industrial revolution. No. Uh, but she's written fifth industrial revolution. What's yeah. the future of academia in 10 years? I, I, I think I have uh, prophesied, I have uh, shared with you my vision about the future of academia in 10 years, where most academia would share uh, the modules or the courses as learning on demand modules. Now, we are not saying that you everyone has to migrate to learning on demand, no. That's too ideal, that's not the situation. What we are saying, you have to integrate learning on demand to your um, traditional courses, the degree courses that you have now, the majority of which is set menu, set menu, but you have to integrate with flexible menu. For example, some of the courses, you need to make them modular. Uh, those, for example, health, safety, and environment, you need to cooperate or collaborate with Department of Health, Safety, and Environment, and try to make this very popular, highly demanded courses available and accessible to industries, not just in Malaysia, okay, yeah, throughout the world. So you have to package the module, Collaborate with the Department of Health, Safety and Environment. What have they taught uh, when they certify people to be safety and health officer? What have they taught? We can do and work together and package this into a smaller modules, yeah, bite-sized modules in UTM curriculum of chemical engineering or mechanical engineering or other engineering that cuts across the board that needs safety, health, and environment because if you go to industry, you need safety, health, and environment. You need to, to have occupational safety. You cannot go to industry without worrying about safety. So it True. cuts across engineering. And it cuts across engineering, you're going for the mass economy of scale. When you're going for the economy of scale and you have certification, you are able to use your traditional academic module as certified health safety officer. At the same time, you give degree you also give certification of safety health and officer, uh, environment officer. You also produce them. They got two degrees. It means that they have an X, X factor that other people don't have. UTM students have X factor that other people don't have because they have extra certification. So these are the things that you need to do, not only for health, safety, and environment, but also construction management. 
energy management for example and certified yeah, Cisco uh, programmer for example or whatever it is that certification out there that's available and you need to integrate in our traditional curriculum so that when lecturers yeah, go through the next few years they have to think along this line how to make many parts of their courses many parts of their curriculum uh, modular and attractive competency based competency based as well as work based yeah, partly mm -hmm. and eventually we will have a complete module of competency based where industry people can even go to the utm take it bit by bit until they say okay i have got enough and i transfer the credit and so i get a degree or a master degree or phd because i have accumulated over three years enough modules from utm that i pay bit by bit so that i can earn a degree after three years after four years for example or after five years while i'm working so many people yeah, you imagine mm -hmm. the market is a lot bigger from people who have graduated 22 years old 23 years old until they go to grave you see these are all the people who wants to learn anything under the sky under the sun they want to learn right so basically you have to make sure that people from the age of 22 23 until people who retire or retire to, to, to from this world to actually be able to learn that way you make our education accessible to everyone across the world who wants to learn anything from anywhere at any Anytime. time mm. amazing uberization yes without we you having take... to go there <laughs> yes okay, no yes without you That's having to lecture you see you ask the uh basically your curriculum will do the job like kfc kfc is once in kentucky but now it's over across the world they just send a recipe true yeah uh, and collect money yeah passive income definitely <laughs> uh, next next question up from dr hardy yeah. how will the universities cope with this demand of making teaching and learning online but assure quality yeah uh i think i also covered this part but i will elaborate a lot more when you work with industry to make your module attractive and of high quality you build in the quality that is needed by industry it means that when you get the certification some of your module yeah online with certification of industry say for example i was i mentioned about health, safety health and environment yeah this module has to be online and uh, when you make it online you work with the industry so that they will be able to recognize that your module can be certified with CPD, Continuing Professional Development, and also has certification and uh, qualified for you to certify us to work from industry. When you bring this to MQA, yeah, when you go through the curriculum uh, review process, you go through the process, make the same account, yeah, review process, and you bring this to MQA, chances are, you will be accredited because this is the quality that the industry wants to produce. Yeah, you meet the high standard of industry so that they, when they are able to certify their workers with uh, the programs that you are offering, just exactly the same as the program they are offering, it means that you build in the quality already. And this one, you also have to uh, get the certification or MQA. We cannot bypass that process of quality. We cannot, regardless, of, uh, regardless of, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a done deal. <laughs> it's a done deal. It's, a, it's given. It's something that must be built in. That's the reason why we say, yeah, UTM prospering life through inclusive, flexible quality education. Quality means quality assured education. Quality assured means there has to be a body to quality assure. And that body Indeed. typically is not only one body it has to be many body industry has to, to also acknowledge certify accredit and uh, the quality assurance body to, to certify as well deliver without compromising quality without without compromising quality yes. amazing uh thank you very much uh professor zainuddin from university of technology malaysia for your keynote speech as a summary the higher education is optimistic uh, for facing challenges of covid 19 pandemic universities believe this is something uh, to uh, this is something as a blessing in disguise, which will confirm to operate for all. 
Now, lecturers, staff, students, industry, community, and the government as well. Uh, thank you, Professor, again for your uh, keynote session. Enjoyed it very much. Uh, thank you, the participants, for your questions. Now, uh, we hope that the keynote session you gave, Prof, would help uh, renew the commitment people have towards teaching and learning, but also education in general. Thank you very much again uh, for your participation. Next, next up, we'll be having for the next session integrated curriculum uh, in higher education. All of you invited to join the session. Until then, I will be seeing you all. Thank you very much and salamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Niza and all. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Visit our Nali Exhibition Virtual Booth. Just follow two simple steps to get there. First, you go to the Facebook page of Nali 2020. Second, you find the photo tabs and then click on the photo album of Nali 2020 Virtual Exhibition. You're now able to view all the posters of Nali practices in teaching and learning. Do enjoy our Virtual Exhibition Booth and the poster with the most likes will be awarded the People's Choice Award. So visit us now and don't forget to like and share. Visit our Nali 2020 Symposium. Just follow this very simple step. First, check the Nali 2020 Symposium schedule in the website. Second, follow the schedule accordingly. Third, go to Facebook page Nali 2020. Fourth, you will see the pin post of the Symposium schedules accordingly in the pin post. Do enjoy your Symposium. You can also view all the session by first using the hashtag Nali 2020 Symposium or second, Find the photo tabs, then click on the timeline photo to view all the symposium presented by our participants. Do enjoy our virtual symposium session and ask questions directly to the speaker under the comment section and don't forget to like and share. Visit our virtual STEM competition. Just follow this very simple step. First, check the STEM Meet competition schedule in the website. Second, follow the schedule accordingly. Third, go to Facebook page Nali 2020. Fourth, you will see the pin post of the STEM Meet schedule accordingly in the post. Do enjoy the STEM Meet competition. You can also view all the session in the video tabs. Then click on the video playlist STEMIT competition to view all the STEMIT presented by our participants. To enjoy our virtual STEMIT competition and don't forget to like and share.